And you know, the biggest change I noticed was in the brain. We have, I believe, something like 10,000 mitochondria per neuron in our brain. I think it's like one to 2,000 per muscle cell and about 5,000 per heart cell. That uh, Alzheimer's disease is actually a disease, and we call that, you know, type 3 diabetes. It's, mm-hmm. it's associated with insulin resistance. We've also heard it's an inability for the brain to go through a process of autophagy and clean out the trash in those neurons. Anyone who wants to learn more beyond our discussion, look up someone, uh, look up the work of Amy Berger. And she's highlighted this very, very well in, in, in a book and numerous um, um, talks on YouTube. But yeah, basically what we see in Alzheimer's disease and other uh, neurological disorders like migraines and epilepsy is that there is this phenomenon of brain glucose hypometabolism. And basically, it's, it's like this. The brain has a, is an energy hog. It is among the highest metabolic rate organs in the body, so it has a high demand for energy. The problem is the brain becomes insulin resistant, is insulin resistant, is that it is no longer able to meet that energy. There develops an energetic gap. And because the person is eating a high starch, high sugar diet, eating every two or three hours, insulin is constantly demanding that the body be in sugar burning mode. And the brain is generally no exception to that. 100% of the brain's energy in the average person is, must be coming from glucose because insulin is telling it to. And secondly, because the alternative fuel isn't available. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But there becomes, so as the brain becomes increasingly insulin resistant, its ability to get sufficient glucose to meet its energetic needs is compromised. And now we have, as I mentioned a moment ago, this energetic gap. And this is brain glucose hypometabolism. It is a a real phenomenon that is detectable in humans years before Alzheimer's settles in. So we can detect and measure this, quantify this in humans. If someone is able to fill that energetic gap, with ketones, then the problem starts to resolve. It's most, most explicitly with seizures, a person who has epilepsy, if they are in ketosis, they may never have another seizure again. M- many, many people, including one of my colleagues just down the hall, they will have frequent migraine headaches, like debilitating headaches, one or two a week. They will go from having one or two a week to having one or two every six months. And, and so there is, even in migraine headaches, some of this energetic mm. um, deficiency. And then even in Alzheimer's disease, we have evidence in humans to show that if you take someone that is in the throes of Alzheimer's disease, p- put them into ketosis rapidly, they will, you can detect immediate improvements in cognition across a variety of tests. Let the brain be a hybrid like human metabolism is a hybrid, burning sugar or fat. With the brain, its hybrid fuels are blood sugar and ketones. But we have to give the ketones to the brain. And you can only have ketones in your blood if the body is in fat burning mode because ketones come from fat burning. And so thus the person who's listening already knows that means insulin must be down. And that is why you see so many, this, this explosion in this area of ketogenic diets as a therapy for Alzheimer's disease. Now, my lab has actually taken our first steps into this phenomenon, this study where we analyzed the gene expression of human brains, so post-mortem brains, brains from people that had no Alzheimer's disease and brains from people that had Alzheimer's disease. And what was so fascinating is that in the, in the Alzheimer's brains, virtually every gene associated with glucose use was, was significantly lower than normal. So this is genes involved in glucose uptake into the brain tissues, the oligodendrocytes, the microglia, the neurons. It, they were compromised. So glucose uptake was significantly down. And glucose catabolism, like the genes involved in actual glycolysis, were also significantly lower than the normal brain. However, when we did the parallel analysis of genes involved in ketone catabolism, ketone uptake and ketone burning, they were normal in the demented, in the Alzheimer's brains. So all more evidence um, surrounding this idea that in Alzheimer's disease, 
glucose metabolism is compromised, but not ketone metabolism. So the best thing we can do for our brains, and indeed, one of the reasons I personally adhere to a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet is to help my brain work and to help fight off Alzheimer's disease, one of the few diseases that I am very much afraid of. So when people think of fat tissue, we typically just think of fat as this inert storage depot, basically a fat cell that is just pulling in fat or a glucose and turning it to fat and then just holding on to it, just storing energy. And then when the body needs the energy, like for example, when insulin is low, now it can start to release the energy to be burned by the muscles, for example. And, and that, that is true, that is typical body fat kind of acts just like I described. But, but once again, it is totally at the, at the whims of insulin. When insulin is up, the fat cell is pulling in energy to store. When insulin is down, it is giving up its energy to be used. However, uh, there is a type of fat in our body called brown fat that is, does not behave the same way. Now, firstly, the differences are obvious, and I do mean obvious. You can, when we do these kinds of studies in animals, you can see the actual difference, and the same thing goes with humans, in the color and appearance of the fat. Normal fat tissue, like the fat that we pull from our, like in my lab, we do what's called fat biopsies, and we pull a little piece of fat from right by the belly button. That is very kind of whitish, yellowish fat. Just like you think when you look at a steak or the fat in, our, in the meat that we eat, it's, it's white. Mm -hmm. Brown fat is much more enriched with mitochondria. And so these brown fat cells are involved in breaking down nutrients, burning energy, but not because the cell needs the energy. In other words, it's not because the person's exercising a lot that the brown fat cells are burning through so much fat and glucose. No, in, in, it's in fact a very wasteful process, although metabolically that becomes an advantage in our environment. But the brown fat is burning fat and glucose just to create heat. If we can kind of hijack our brown fat cells to be more active, or if we can help our white fat cells act a little more like brown fat cells, it's this process known as beijing, then we have a higher metabolic rate. These fat cells suddenly stop just storing energy and now they just start burning it just to, be, just to increase body heat, body temperature. And one of the ways we can kind of hack that process of converting our white fat into brown fat, one is through just cold exposure. You can sit in 18 mm. degrees Celsius water, which is not very pleasant. <laughs> um, or you can increase your ketones. When a human is in ketosis, the metabolic rate in their fat cells goes up about two or three times. Hmm. Likely because it's shifting its profile. It's going from this very low metabolic rate, typical white fat cell to this much higher metabolic rate, brown fat cell. So that's something we can exploit just by manipulating our diet. So this idea that fasting, intermittent fasting, is going to slow metabolic rate, it is absolutely false. That does right. not happen. We can measure this phenomenon in humans. Metabolic rate goes up. Fasting, this, this real explosion in the interest in fasting, intermittent fasting, um, which I think is a good thing for us to be interested in, but they, they use it as sort of a binge and purge cycle where they fast all day, and then evening comes around and they're so hungry and they've not planned well for ending the fast and they just eat they binge on all kinds of junk they make themselves painfully full they regret it they have they have remorse they sleep poorly so how we end the fast is the most important part of the fast and i encourage anyone just to really have that meal planned have a, a goal in mind eat a certain amount and then force yourself just to say i'm going to stop right now and then see how I am in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, because very, very likely the person will be, they'll be very surprised at how little they actually need to eat once they've ended their fast. Certainly uh, somebody that's doing it incorrectly can, can actually trigger an eating disorder. So, you know, you need to do it appropriately. The first one I like to, and I think it's first for a reason. I put it first for a reason. It is control carbohydrates. 
So be smart about the starches and the sugars that you're eating. Um, limit them greatly, much, much more, limit them to a much lower degree than what you're currently eating. And depending on the person's underlying insulin sensitivity, you know, what they see from their triglyceride to HDL ratio, for example, um, I would say that number is best heavily scrutinized to about 50 grams per day. But if, if someone has a pretty good triglyceride to HDL ratio, well, then they can certainly be more liberal with that number and they don't need to cut it to such a low level. But the first step is control carbohydrates, stop drinking fruit juice, stop eating bread and cereal and crackers and chips and focus on real sources if they, of carbohydrate if they want them, namely fruits and vegetables, but eat them, don't drink them. The second variable is prioritize protein. Make sure if you want to age well, eat enough protein and get the right kind of protein. There is a number, Stu Phillips in Eastern Canada found that 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram of, of, of ideal body mass, that's an optimal range. Plant protein is inferior to animal protein in every way. Um, the, the amino acid profile is not comparable. It is far superior in animal proteins. And animal proteins also are cleaner, and that might be surprising to say, but all plant proteins, to my knowledge, have molecules in the plant protein that will uh, inhibit the body's ability to digest the plant protein, um, like phytic acids or tannins or trypsin inhibitors. These are found in all plant proteins, and that further exacerbates the lower um, uh, biological value of the plant protein. And then I would also add, there was a, a, a study done by a nonprofit organization called the Clean Label Project, and they analyzed protein supplements for the presence and levels of heavy metals, things like lead and arsenic, known to be harmful to humans, and plant proteins were the biggest offenders. Mm. And that's a consequence of, of basically what we've done here. Plants are so naturally so deficient in protein that when you're trying to get protein from a pea, you've got to get a thousand peas together to get one serving of protein. And the protein is what you want to get, although again, it's not as high value as you think. In the process of concentrating those peas, you're also going to get things you don't want, like the natural minerals or metals that every plant is pulling up from the soil. But when you're just eating peas, it is such an insignificant amount, it's so little. But when you're now concentrating the peas to get to the protein, you're also getting these metals with them. And so you have um, potentially what they call toxic levels of, of these um, heavy metals. And fat and protein come together in nature. The best protein sources, animal, mm -hmm. come with fat. And fat helps the protein digest better. The bile acids that we get released when we eat fat actually improve protein digestion. And so there's a reason that fat and pro the best proteins in nature come with fat. It helps, not only are there studies to show that digestion is improved, but it also makes the protein more anabolic. In a study in humans, that when you mix protein and fat together, you have a better muscle anabolic response than, than just the protein alone. Fast, uh, don't feel the need to eat every moment of the day. I strongly, I'm a strong advocate of looking at one of the meals on the ends of the day and cutting it out at least from time to time. If not, if not every day, then at least maybe a few days a week. Let the body have a, fat, a period of fasting. When insulin has come down, it might be a little uncomfortable sometimes. We yeah. have hundreds of thousands of calories stored as energy just waiting to be used. So when I see someone about to go on a little hike, you know, here in the beautiful mountains of Utah, they will have, I may see an overweight person and they will have energy bars and energy drinks. And I'm just thinking how tragic. Yeah. All they needed to bring was some maybe water and maybe some salt. Yeah. Let your body use its own energy. Every one of those fat cells is basically a little energy bar just waiting to be cracked open and used speculating somewhat, I would say that a decent marker is the presence of ketones hmm. because ketones themselves are a consequence of pronounced catabolism, like in other words, fat burning. 
low insulin. So I like to think that when ketones are starting to come up in the blood, so too is autophagy. And there's some evidence to suggest that that's a pretty good correlation, but please everyone know, I'm not stating that with any high degree of authority. It's probably a marker of autophagy. So if we based it on that, in the average person eating a typical American diet, if they fast for around 16 hours, they start to get into ketosis. And so I, I kind of look at that number and I think an 18.6 is a nice, easy way to probably have some autophagy from time to time. And of course, if you couple that with a low carb diet, well then you're cooking with gas. My top five, so I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of red meat. Yeah, um, me too. Uh, really, it's, it's one of the staples that I try to have in my home. And it's as a father, that's something I want my kids to eat. It might sound funny to say it's certainly Buck's convention or, or dogmatic thinking of nutrition and diet. I want them to eat their meat first. And then whatever they pick on their broccoli and et cetera, that's great. It's, you know, it's fine. It adds some color to the plate. But I know the broccoli isn't going to make them grow strong and healthy. It'll be what's in that red meat. So I'm a big fan of red meat. I personally love hamburger. Mm. And my favorite dinner is just, we, I buy my beef from a, a local, um, actually he's a professor in the Russian department and he <laughs> just has a small little ranch on the side, so to speak. And so I buy my meat from him, but we, we make little hamburger patties. We mix in an egg with the hamburger mm -hmm. and then we split it out. I love it. Yep. And it gives it a little kind of crispy to it as well. Yeah. It's delicious. Yeah, Anyone it's who is going to grill some hamburger, add an egg and mix it in next time. And eggs are actually probably number two. I, I love eggs. Uh, when I make breakfast for my kids, which I do every morning, it's very commonly kind of low carb waffles or low carb pancakes or even crepes, although yeah. the crepes are kind of hit or miss. Yeah, I load them with eggs. Yeah. So eggs are a staple. We go through, in my little family of five, we probably go through three dozen eggs a week. I don't know. I'm kind of running out. Eggs and meat are my, are my, are my go-to. I will say at the risk of um, uh, sounding kind of self-congratulatory here, uh, but I, I've, I've made, a, I made a, a meal replacement shake with a couple of my brothers. We created a website. We sell it online. It's Get Health, and that's H-L-T-H, Get Health, H-L-T-H.com, and they can learn more about it. But I actually rely on that shake pretty often. shake manufacturers want to use plant protein is that they are so much cheaper. Mm. You know, a fraction of the cost of say like egg and whey, which are the best proteins in the two that we used in, in our shake, but they're so much cheaper. And when you have plant proteins, you can brag about it on your label and say, this is, you know, vegan friendly or whatever. And so it lets you kind of virtue signal to the potential buyer and save money because it's so cheap.